But thank you for standing by. All lines have been placed on listen-only mode until the question-answer session of today's call. At that time, please press star 1, unmute your phone, and record your name to ask a question. Today's call is also being recorded. If you disagree, you may disconnect. Please continue to hold. The call will begin shortly. Everybody and welcome to this NASA Media Telecon. I am Karen Fox with the Office of Communications, uh, and we are talking today about the follow-up to the Psyche Independence Review Board report. Uh, is a, we'll hear more about that uh, as we go around, but there was an original report, and this is a follow-up that was requested and the NASA response. You will be hearing today from Nicholas Fox, the Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters in Washington, Lori Glaze, who is the Division Director for Planetary Sciences at NASA Headquarters, Lori Leshen, who is the Director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California, and Thomas Young, who is the Chair of this Psyche Independent Review Board. Uh, everybody's going to have a few opening remarks, and then we will leave time for question and answers. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Nikki Fox. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so NASA Science Mission Directorate is really happy that the Psyche mission is on track for launch this October. As I'm sure you will recall, um, SMD launched an independent review board for the Psyche mission when the team announced that they could no longer make the 2022 launch date. Um, you know, we're really not afraid at NASA to take an unflinching view on what we do. And so NASA and JPL co-convened the independent review in July, and it, it, July of last year, and its report was delivered in November of 2022. Um, we're really happy um, to see that uh, um, the Independent Review Board not only validated the decision to move forward with the mission, but also has said that the work done to address all of their recommendations has totally exceeded their already high expectations. The really cool thing was their review board helped us identify multiple issues that contributed to the delay, and that included communication, oversight, and staffing. And so what you're going to hear today is an update on the recommendations that were issued last November. And again, I'm so pleased to say that the progress made at JPL is not only outstanding, but is world class as uh, determined by our uh, review board. Um, while uh, our JPL director, Laurie Leshen, will go over many of the changes that were implemented, it is important to keep in mind that even though it was JPL that was reviewed here, these issues are something that we really must take seriously um, as well as the industry as a whole. Um, we certainly don't feel that we can rest or um, even believe that the issues have gone away or will go away. Um, you know, what we really feel here is that we've started um, to change, and this change must continue in order to address address our issues of workforce uh, oversight and planning for the future. But as I say, it's a really good news story today, and so I'm delighted to pass it on to Tom Young, who will present um, the, uh, the IRB findings. Uh, thank you, Nikki. Um, my first comment is that uh, uh, the IRB believes the response to our Psyche project and JPL institution findings and recommendations to be excellent. Um, when you read the report, which I believe you probably have by now, 
uh, you'll see that we scored the responses to each of our recommendations with three possible grades. Uh, we, the three grades were adequate, adequate with additional um, work, and not adequate. The, I really want to be sure you understand as you read the report that the IRB considers both of the first two grades to be outstanding. We believe that Psyche is, in a, is on a positive course for an October 2023 launch. We believe the 2023 launch readiness date is credible and the over pro overall probability of mission success is high. Uh, we commended the exceptional contributions of the principal investigator, the Psyche Project, JPL Senior Leadership, and JPL Line Organization in reaching this status for the Psyche Project. The IRB recognized that our JPL institution findings or recommendations were challenging and really require considerable time to complete the required corrective actions. However, we believed it was important, as did NASA and JPL, to assess progress after approximately five months of work. We were impressed by the results we observed that were well beyond our high expectations. We reviewed the responses to the findings and, uh, and recommendations in senior management engagement, hiring and retention, hybrid work environment, and Caltech governance to be essentially complete and excellent. The progress and the future plans for freight project workload and line organization issues was most impressive. While there is uh, extreme um, amount of work to go in these two areas, the IRB is a confident that this will occur. So the accomplishments in response to the JPL issues are the result, direct result of the engagement and leadership of the JPL director and senior leadership which were, as has been mentioned, judged by the IRB as being world class. Uh, with that, uh, I uh, turn the, uh, it over to our next speaker, who will be Laura Lesham, Director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. And uh, thanks especially to the full uh, IRB team for your intensive work with us over the last nine months or so, um, and we're very pleased to get to share the results of, um, of our efforts here to put both the Psyche mission and the JPL institution on track. And thank you, Nikki, as well, for your very kind comments and your support. Um, certainly, when I started as JPL director just over a year ago, it, and this happened sort of within weeks of, of me joining JPL, I felt it was really important to get an independent assessment so to help me take the steps necessary along with our senior team here to get the lab on track and, and get Psyche and all of our other missions on track. So we, we greatly appreciate the independent look that the IRB took and also the collaboration with colleagues at NASA headquarters to get that done jointly. So um, I'm just going to share with you a little bit about our response. And, and both on the Psyche side as well as on the institutional side. Um, there's more about that summary in the, the slides that the IRB ha has put together. And again, happy to discuss further in Q&A if folks would like. But so it, in line with the IRB's initial report, we made significant changes both in the Psyche project and the JPL institution. And here's some examples for Psyche. We added highly experienced staff to the team, including project manager Matt Wallace, and we reorganized the team around the work to go. At this point, I am pleased to report that the project is very nearly through all the key software testing that was the main challenge at the time of the delay, um, and that has gone well, and, uh, and the team is on track with, with margin. Um, our team is heading to Florida to begin the final testing of the spacecraft in preparation for launch. The spacecraft has remained in Florida since, uh, since last year. Right now, we have about 18 weeks to go. I counted myself last night. 
Uh, we have about 18 weeks to go before launch, and we have about seven weeks of schedule margin against that 18 weeks. So we're in really good shape. The project, in, I'm very pleased to report, is green across the board and on track for our October launch. So go Psyche. Very, very proud of that team. For the institutional response, uh, here are a few examples of actions we've taken. So um, back at the end of January, our new hybrid work policy went into effect which um, asked most people on our, our workforce to return to the lab at least three days a week and enabled project leadership to, um, to name those days so that teams could have really huddle up times when they're together on lab. And as a result, our daily attendance on lab is nearly double what it was in spring of 2022. So we've seen a big change in, um, as a result of a new hybrid work policy and working with the projects on that. We've optimized our hiring and retention efforts, and we're bringing in more experienced workforce. We have um, hired hundreds of experienced employees in the last nine months, and including about more than 50 of those are people who had previously been at JPL who left for other places during the Great Resignation and in some cases before that, but we've, we've brought them back to the lab. We've attracted them back to JPL. And again, they're, they're uh, very experienced and have the experience we need to work on our missions. And I'm also very pleased to report that our turnover rate is um, back at its historic levels, which is about just under 5% per year at the lab, which for those of you that follow the in aerospace industry closely, you'll know that's quite low. Um, uh, and we're, we're pleased to see that back where it belongs. So we've overcome our workforce issues, our missions are staffed, and we are um, much stronger today. And we have put a laser focus on staffing the projects. So again, we're, we're in very good shape staffing-wise with Europa Clipper, with NISAR, with Marcy Apple Return staffing. Um, and by the way, speaking of our missions, all of our current missions are considering the results of the Psyche IRB and incorporating the lessons learned into their activities. For example, Europa Clipper has recently undergone a similar reorganization that Psyche went through, which helps focus more on what I would call the end game of getting a mission to the pad, focused on verification and validation of software, creation of flight rules, and close out of the paperwork associated with ensuring that all the key risks have been appropriately reviewed and managed. In addition, we've overhauled our approach to monthly project status reviews at my level, at the senior leadership level of the lab to ensure that we have more significant senior management oversight of our, um, of our most critical missions. We are working to make sure that in those reviews, that we're setting up those reviews such that the most important issues are being brought forward and discussed in depth, setting the right tone for people to raise issues and concerns. We're not just asking the project managers how it's going, we're talking to multiple members of the team, and in every case we're asking what the teams to tell us specifically what do they need from the institution to support them being successful. So total overhaul of monthly project status. And finally, we've strengthened the line organization, that's our sort of our engineering organization, their technical oversight and execution of missions in several ways that I can get into if people have questions about that. Um, so those are just a few examples, and the list is long. Uh, as Tom said, uh, we, are, we are not done changing JPL for the better. Um, while ensuring we keep what's special and unique about this place, we're gonna continue to work to make ourselves better, and we're gonna track the forward work from here. We're not slowing down just because the Psyche IRB is concluding its work. What we've done here in the last six months or so is really exciting, and I want to thank our team that's leaders across the entire lab for responding quickly and with impact and with actions that are sustainable into the future. Um, I, you know, Tom and, and Nikki described the response as world class, uh, the IRB did in the report, and I know that's what we all expect of JPL, and it's, I'm really pleased that we have really delivered and, and, and thrilled to hear that high recognition for what we've accomplished. Um, in closing, I would just say, to me, this proves what I have always known to be true, which is that JPL can achieve anything it sets its mind to, and I'm very proud to be able to share some of that with you today. So thank you for that, and now I'll hand off to Lori Glaze. Great. Thank you, Lori. Uh, appreciate that, and, and really appreciate the, the dedicated effort that you and the JPL uh, leadership team have put into uh, the responses to, to all of the findings. I want to take the opportunity to, of course, thank Tom and the entire IRB. 
Um, this has been invaluable, uh, the feedback that we've gotten from you. Um, and as Nikki mentioned at the top, um, not just to Psyche and to JPL, but I think for all of our um, all of our endeavors across the Science Mission Directorate, this has been uh, really uh, insightful. Um, I, I also want to take this opportunity to especially commend uh, the Psyche Mission Principal Investigator, uh, Lindy Elkins-Tanton, the Project Manager, Matt Wallace, and the Deputy Project Manager, Henry Stone, uh, for their leadership throughout this really difficult period. Um, not only did they uh, do first-rate work um, responding to all of the IRB findings, but they were also able to keep the team inspired um, at the same time, and they, they really excelled in both areas, and, and just my heartfelt thanks to, uh, to the leadership team on, on Psyche. Just a, a few comments here on the Psyche project. Um, we are on track. The project is on track for launch in 2023. You heard from, from Tom Young that the, that's been assessed by the IRB. Um, they assessed the work that's been completed since the last report, since the report that was uh, released in November. And as you heard, they, you, they noted um, that uh, the project has exceeded expectations in all areas. Um, of course, there's still work to go. There's work ahead um, in order to get to launch, um, but that work really is, is the work that any mission needs to complete as it prepares for the launch and operation. The key here um, is that the mission is on track um, and, and certainly better prepared uh, to handle the work ahead um, as, they, as they move closer to the launch. Um, NASA headquarters, the program office, and the project standing review board uh, will continue to work closely with JPL and with Psyche um, at every step along the way uh, to ensure mission success and to ensure the, the on-time launch of Psyche. Um, and so with that, I'm going to toss it back to Karen Fox for the Q&A. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. A uh, reminder to our reporters that you can ask a question by uh, hitting star one. Uh, also, uh, I didn't mention at the top of the telecon that this report and the NASA response is available at nasa.gov slash live. Right now, there's a link to it right there at the top of that page. So go there for, for additional details and information about what we're, we're discussing today. Uh, with that, I will go to our first question, which is from Eric Berger of Ars Technica. Uh, good afternoon, and congratulations to everyone on this uh, this great news. Um, two questions. First of all, um, can maybe Nicola or someone talk about, in plain terms, the lessons learned from all of this for for ongoing and future science missions? And then, just can you update us on the total cost of the Psyche mission and and how much this one-year delay added to that? Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, the the future funding for Psyche uh, to meet all the the life cycle costs, etc., will be worked with our stakeholders through our annual budget process. So um, you can sort of stay tuned for that. Um, in terms of of lessons learned, and I'm you know I'm, I'm actually ha happy for uh, Laurie Lesh and or, or Laurie Glaze to also jump in on here. But I think it's really um, it, it's about making sure that you have the right workforce, um, that you have the right people doing the right jobs, um, and that you, you, know, you, you have a really accurate and effective communications path so that if there are issues and there are strains in the missions, that they have a, uh, an easy way to be able to raise that flag and, and deal with that, um, that, that issue quickly so that everything stays on schedule. But it's really about having, having the right people um, in, uh, in the mix. Um, so, Laurie Lesson, do you want to jump in because you're really in the thick of the lessons learned? Well, I thought you did a great job there, there, Nikki. Actually, so it's about yeah, making sure that that we have the the team give the team every chance to succeed, and that includes having a lot of opportunities for um, upward network communication, which obviously the pandemic really significantly hampered. It wasn't the, ma the only cause of what happened here, but it definitely um, contributed to it, both in terms of communication within the team and also um, with uh, senior leadership. So, but I, you know, somebody said to me the other day that mission success is dodging a thousand bullets and sometimes the other non-mission success is dodging 999. And the truth is that this team did a lot of things right, and they managed to get a spacecraft that was almost ready to fly to the Cape. Wasn't quite ready, though. And so we did the right thing by, 
by raising our hands and doing the hard, taking the hard step of saying we're not ready, we can't do this with acceptable risk. So I think that's the other thing um, that I take away from this is that NASA, you know, brave courage in that moment was re was rewarded um, and was treated appropriately, right? That that the team did the right thing by saying, you know what, we're not there, we're not ready. And NASA did the right thing by not only learning lessons from this, but continuing that mission. And now we're gonna get to go explore a fascinating metal world. All right, uh, thank you very much. We will move on to our next question, which is Jeff Faust from Space News. Uh, good afternoon. Question probably for Dr. Fox. Um, has NASA done similar reviews at other centers that are involved with science missions to make sure that there aren't similar issues, be it with hybrid work or communications or, or other issues that might cause similar problems for other science missions? In other words, being a little bit more proactive in, in checking for these issues before they do cause a problem? Um, hey, Jeff, that's an excellent question. Um, so we're not doing a, like the full-up reviews. Obviously, they're, they're very detailed, uh, take a lot of time and a lot of effort, as I'm sure Tom Young will tell you how much effort these take. But what we are doing is we're uh, making a very concerted effort to ensure that all of the, um, all of the lessons learned and you know any sort of best practices, et cetera, are being filtered to, or not being filtered, that's the wrong word, are being um, openly passed. Um, to all of the other centers. And so, uh, you know, folks in SMD are working uh, actively to make sure that that happens um, so that, you know, these sort of best practices, um, full transparency, uh, you know, the, the communication path, the, the right um, workforce, et cetera, is, is, um, is being implemented at, at the other centers that are doing the science missions just to, to um, make sure we don't fall into this, this again. As I, I said in my notes, it's not that we've solved everything um, here or, or you know, where everything's great. What we're doing is we're starting these new processes to make sure that this kind of thing doesn't recur in, in other centers. Great. Uh, thank you so much. We are going to move on to our next question, which is from Emily Lakdawalla at Sky and Telescope. Hi. I was uh, wondering what the um, progress on the responding to the IRB's recommendations means for um, starting work again on Veritas, perhaps, and, and uh, accelerating the production of that mission. So, um, Lori Glaze, do you want to hit that one? Yes, I'll take that one. So this is Lori Glaze. Um, thank you, Emily, for the question. Um, so this is certainly a really important step and one of the things that we had identified as uh, you know, a, a key criterion uh, for being able to restart the work uh, on Veritas. It's certainly really good news that a lot of the workforce um, challenges that were identified by the IRB, that those have been addressed and we, we are seeing uh, missions that are being uh, fully staffed. That's all great. Um, we also had identified um, that we need to make sure that some of the really, the, the bigger projects at JPL are staying on track um, and not impacting some of the other work going on. Uh, one of those was making sure that NISAR uh, was delivered on time. That has happened, it is delivered, so that's a great milestone there as well. The other one is making sure that Europa Clipper stays on track for its launch. I'm in October of 2024, so I, I fully expect by this time next year to have good good indications uh, of where Clipper is um, on its uh, on its pathway. Um, the what we've been saying, and I'm going to uh, stick to what we've been saying, is that we're working through uh, the the budget process right now, looking while we're looking at the fiscal year 25 budget. And as part of that process, we are looking mm -hmm. at what the landscape looks like for uh, restart for Veritas. Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, our next question is from Teresa Foley of Aerospace America. Hi, and uh, congratulations for all the positives that you're citing to us. I wanted to um, ask uh, Tom Young and perhaps Dr. Fox for um, a broader overview of what the, um, sorry, I'm getting double stuff on my phone here. Um, what 
um, is the overall picture of how many engineering and technology job openings NASA has overall right now, and what is the shortfall. I'm particularly interested in how you see um, your job openings competing with Silicon Valley or um, the commercial space industry, other sectors, uh, for this, what is apparently um, a very limited talent pool. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. So we are limited on sharing any information about uh, hiring hiring policies and and you know numbers like that, uh, and definitely don't have any off the very you know top of our top of our head right now what what kinds of openings we have. Um, I would certainly invite uh, either either Nikki or or Lori Lesson to weigh in if they want to add something else to that. Um, but but the the specific numbers you just asked for are not something that that we can hand out. Um, I'm more than happy to look up uh, in more detail what we can share with you and get back to you. Yeah, I think Lori Lesson had, had yeah. some nice comments on just, I mean, just your, your retention, uh, obviously only yeah. in the board things, because I know, you know, we can't give out that information, but Lori, you want to repeat it? Yeah, so right now our um, sort of annual retention rate, if you will, like turnover in a given year is, is about 5%. I think it's 11 or 12% on average in aerospace, but you should really check me on that. Um, but, um, you know, it's been interesting recently. Well, so I'll say two things. One, there is more competition with the commercial space sector because there is a much more significant commercial space sector, which has been part of NASA's strategy for, you know, for a very long time. And it's really actually, like, as hard as it can be for us, it's actually gratifying to see that, that the investments that, that we are making and the partnerships that we are building to help advance the commercial space sector are really working. And so I can, on one hand, be upset, but I can also, you know, be uh, heartened that we have such a resilient and growing commercial space sector. But it definitely means, you know, here in LA, there's a lot of sort of space startups and growing space companies, and that's great. And you know what? Overall, over time, it's not necessarily a bad thing that people have multiple types of experience. And so I, I actually think that's okay. But we just need to make sure that we're paying really close attention to making sure that we have the workforce we need to get our work done. So that's on that side. On the Silicon Valley side, you know, I'm sure you've been reading about Silicon Valley-based layoffs in the last few months. When we hear about that or, you know, unfortunately if one of the, uh, if a space company is having challenges, we are, our, our human resources team is aggressive at setting up a job fair at making sure we're doing directed outreach to um, former employees of those companies to make sure that there could, that we're finding those where there could be a place for them at JPL. So we're also being opportunistic there as things shift and change. Yeah, this is Tom Young. If I might add to it, I, I don't have any numbers for NASA, but my observations clearly are that as, as, Lori just mentioned, the competitive environment for the kind of people we're talking about is is very strong. And, you know, numbers are important, but the most important thing is people who have the experience necessary to do the extraordinary things that JPL and, and NASA does. And that's probably where the resource is, uh, is most limited and also is in greatest demand with uh, with the various uh, industrial components uh, that exist. And I think that's why one of the things that JPL did in response to uh, our report was, uh, I would say, significantly revamped, revamped, excuse me, the hiring and retention uh, function at JPL. And this required, you know, spending a lot of effort identifying who are your most important people, being sure that they understand the, their role and their importance in the organization, uh, and also um, uh, in competing with others, recognize that uh, time is important and critical, and you have to move fast in the hiring uh, phase of, uh, of the competitive uh, environment that, that exists. So it really, it really took JPL, what I'll say is a whole new way of going about uh, retention and hiring. And I think they've done that with, uh, with, with extraordinary excellence. I'll add one other thing. JPL and NASA 
also have a what I call a competitive advantage. There are not many places you can go work and explore space. And uh, at least to me, uh, having been involved in that pretty much all my life, that's that's pretty cool and pretty exciting. And uh, and they they're both great places to work. And if people can really uh, understand the opportunity that they have to grow and expand in careers, uh, that also is is an effective tool in both competing for and retaining people. That, I, I think that's still your I think question. we still have background noise, but I so I believe we're ready to move on. I am going on to our next question, which is from Marina Corin of the Atlantic. Hi, um, this is a kind of a follow-up to Emily's question earlier. Uh, given that NASA and JPL were prioritizing Psyche, how many people were pulled from the Veritas mission to work on Psyche? Um, and a general question about workforce needs on planetary missions, has JPL ever experienced this level of understaffing and lack of talent before? Thanks. So I'm, I'm going to let Laurie answer that, but I, I, I don't think there's lack of talent at JPL. I'm just going to put that one out there. Uh, Laurie Lesson. Thank you, Nikki. In fact, we spent quite a lot of time talking to the IRB about the incredible depth of the talent and capabilities here on all of our missions from Clipper to MSR to Psyche. Um, so, you know, the, nobody was pulled exactly. What, what happened with Veritas is it didn't ramp it didn't ramp up as expected, and Psyche stayed ramped up longer. So it is. Um, so it's it's a bit hard, a bit of a hard question to answer. Um, yeah. So so Psyche was has been staffed for most of this year at about 160 JPLers, and some of those may have gone off to work Veritas if it launched, but um, I'm not certain of those numbers. Uh, if Psyche launched, I mean. Then. Thank you very much, Lori. Lesson. Oh, and about the staffing question about is this unusual? I mean, when I said talent, I mean I mean that as a corporate term, right? You know, like just yeah. people who work at JPL. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean to individuals. Imply, that's what you meant. Got it. Um, I, you know, I've only been here a year, so I'm not certain I can I, I can answer that. It's. You know, when you've got multiple large missions pressing for launch, there's um, and you know everyone here has to be able to charge their time to something. So you, we always, I would say, run tight, right? We do, you cannot have people here who are who don't have an assigned job, and so we're always trying to do just-in-time staffing, I would say, and manage that and optimize that across a lot of different missions. So it's a it is a challenge, and it's one that takes. Um, senior management attention, and I think as all organizations were in the pandemic, that senior management attention was was on a lot of things, and and uh, so you know now we're back to really making sure that we are optimizing the distribution of talent across our missions, and that is paying dividends by them all being staffed with great teams. All right, thank you so much. Uh, moving on to our next. Uh, reporter, our, the question will be from Shannon Hall with Scientific American. Hi, thank you. Um, this is along a similar lines. I'm just curious if you could elaborate a little bit more on some of those staffing issues. I mean, is it simply that there's increased competition from the private space tech sector or are there other issues happening at JPL and what have you really done to optimize your hiring and retention um, and specifically bring back those employees who had left? Have you been able to increase your salaries, offer better benefits? Um, yeah, what else? Okay, right, I, guess. I think that's you again. <laughs> that, one, that one is for me. Um, yeah, I mean, can't really get into lots of specifics. Obviously, these are individuals that we want to be respectful of. But um, but again, I think Tom said it best. We have um, overhauled. We did, we've increased the number of, of staff in our uh, recruitment team. And we always have tried to stay in touch with 
former JPLers, and we're stepping that up as well, and just to try to keep people connected to us so that um, it might well be that they uh, decide they want to come back based on what I think could be a lot of factors. I won't tell you that I have spoken individually to any of these folks to sort of hear their stories, so I don't, I don't have um, specific details on why someone made the decisions they made. Um, but we are focused on things like making sure that um, that compensation and benefits are, are competitive. One of the things you may have heard about that we did over the last year was um, was make sure we had paid parental leave for all parents. That was uh, that's relatively generous at eight weeks of paid parental leave. So, um, which was a new benefit for us. So there are things like that that we are looking at all the time to make sure that um, we have the world class workforce we need to do our world class missions. Thanks for the question. All right, a reminder, if you have a question to ask, go ahead and press star one to get in the queue. Uh, and our next question is from Marcia Smith with Space Policy Online. Thanks so much for taking my question. Uh, it's for Tom Young. I'm just uh, glancing through the slides here uh, on the web. And of course, I've only had a couple minutes to do that. But I do notice that you've got, I think it's three areas where the response was appropriate with additional work needed, and only one that was inadequate, which was the SRB review process. Could you talk a bit about those, and especially the SRB review process, and are you going to be following up on this since you, it the, seems to be the only one that is inadequate? Um, good question, Marsha. Um, I'll, I'll type that one first. Um, we were asked when we when we uh, started this activity to look at um, a small number of kind of special topics uh, to see what role it may, may have played in the um, uh, in the psyche issues that exist. And one of those was to look at the SRB uh, activity. And our basic conclusion was, when we looked at the SRB, was that though they had some understanding of issues that existed in the software development activity, uh, that they did not identify the problem uh, to the degree that was necessary or with sufficient timeliness to take corrective action and by the way, they weren't unique in that. That was a pretty much across the board observation uh, that, that we made. So we actually then dug a little bit deeper in the, in the SRB process uh, because it can be a, an extraordinarily uh, credible or uh, manage, project management, management tool. And our basic observations were that uh, there are a collection of elements that are involved in the SRB process. One is the SRB itself. It's pretty important, one, that the right people for the particular project that's being uh, reviewed uh, or, or selected to be on the SRB. It's also important that they meet frequent enough that they are um, kind of in tune with what's going on with the project. So. The second thing that's pretty important is that the project and the SRB have a relationship that effectively communicates issues and, and uh, treats them with the importance that's, uh, that's necessary. Again, our observation was that uh, the SRB, um, I guess I'd say, uh, indication there may be some issues were not really clarified to the degree that the project made a judgment that they were issues that uh, were deserving of a lot of attention. There's a third part of that's really involved, and that is the SRB process is really a process of NASA headquarters, and uh, they have the overall responsibility for SRBs. And I think it was also true that uh, they also were not um, responsive to um, some of the indications from the SRB, which were also not well uh, uh, defined. And so our general observation was, and the reason for the inadequate was that um, our belief is that the SRB process can really be a valuable contributor, not only to, to Psyche, but to 
pretty much all of NASA's projects. And uh, our observations based on the psyche experience, and by the way, many of us had knowledge of the process above and beyond psyche, and we had similar um, um, ob observations, that it was something that really needed a lot of attention. And to NASA's credit, NASA agreed. I mean, NASA also believes it needs a lot of attention. And they have special activities that are ongoing at the current time to better understand the issues, both those that we identified and others identified, to really strengthen this, uh, I call it a today weak link in the project management chain. So I, I feel pretty good about having an inadequate uh, assessment. And you, that may sound strange, but, but I think sometimes you really have to face very hard uh, issues that are deserving of additional, additional attention and be sure that uh, the evaluation is such that responses will evolve that are really critical to, uh, uh, to the corrective action. And my observation is that's happening at NASA today. I've, I've heard their plans and I'm familiar with what it is they're doing. And, uh, and I applaud very much the fact that I have high expectations that we are going to actually get this SRB process under control so that we really can count on it to be a check and a balance on flight projects. Yeah, Tom, this is Lori Glaze. I'd like to just jump in real quick um, to add a little bit more to this, Marsha. And, you know, this is a really key uh, finding from the IRB that in regard to the standing review board process. And as, as Tom mentioned, um, these review boards, you know, we've got typical processes that, that uh, regularly look at our projects. We have a real opportunity now to respond to some of the direct findings from the IRB to make these SRBs really add significantly more value to our missions as we go through development. Um, but this is so much bigger than just Psyche or even just JPL. In fact, it's even bigger than all of the Science Mission Directorate. Uh, the intent here is to take the findings and really uh, overhaul or, or relook at um, the SRB processes across, um, across all of NASA. Um, and so uh, the agency now um, has a, a chief program management officer who is David Mitchell, uh, who is also a member of the IRB, so he's very familiar with what the findings are and the intent. Um, and he's leading an effort that's agency-wide in, in looking at the SRB process and how we can improve that process, again, to, to add more value uh, to, our, to each of our missions that we're developing. Marcia, if I could also add, uh, you, you also asked about other areas where we had additional work necessary, and I'll just cite a couple examples so you can get a feel for uh, what it was we were talking about. Uh, one of the special items we were asked to look at was the Maxar um, relationship on the um, on the Psyche project, and our observations were quite positive until the COVID circumstance really complicated the relationship. But the reason that we have uh, on that particular one adequate, uh, or excuse me, appropriate with additional work required is that it, it's a necessary that the lessons learned out of that experience be documented because I think they can be very valuable to others. Um, I think there's always been an intent to, to document them, but we kind of had additional work required to focus on this documentation to just make sure that it got the the, uh, the appropriate level of attention to be sure that it was properly executed. Another example was that when we first looked at Psyche uh, way back at when we were first established and right after the the launch had been uh, had been deferred, um, we looked at other things that uh, that existed at that time, and one of the areas was operational readiness and. Our assessment, which is very well documented in our original report, was that uh, operational readiness had not received much attention at that particular time uh, in the program, uh, and largely probably because of the uh, other items, the GNC software issues, uh, as an example. But when we did our uh, assessment, uh, we did take a lot of look at operational readiness, the progress in that arena was significantly good. 
but still a lot to be done. So we chose to put some emphasis in additional work required uh, on operational readiness, not so much that, that we didn't think the right activities would be done, but again, just to uh, kind of put a stake in the ground as to how important it was to do this in a, in a timely fashion and, and to be sure that it got the emphasis that was necessary. So I would say that's how we use the concept of additional work required uh, not somewhat, not as a negative, but as an area that says, in addition to all the other good things that are do, being done in this area, be sure that these particular items that we highlighted get the necessary attention that's necessary to, uh, to maximize the probability of success. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of appreciation. As I said in my introductory remarks, and I'd like to repeat here, uh, appropriate or appropriate with additional work required both, in our view, were outstanding ratings, and one just saying we were asking for attention of these kinds of items that, that you and I are now talking about. Thank you so much, Tom, for that uh, for for the nice detailed answer there. Uh, moving on to our next question, we have Emily Lakdawalla from Sky and Telescope. Hi, uh, this question is for Lori. Um, I was just wondering, um, to what extent do you blame the pandemic for the workforce and oversight issues that were revealed by the report, or were these problems already brewing before 2020? And then I have a follow-up to that. So I assume that's me, Lori, Lori Leshen. Um, right. <laughs> Emily, thank you. Um, so, look, I think as the original IRB report found, the pandemic was a contributor to um, where we found ourselves with Psyche. Uh, and I agree with that. Um, I think it was a contributor in uh, several ways, um, but one of those ways was in uh, the level of senior management attention because, again, as I was not at JPL at that time, I was running a university, and I can tell you a lot of senior management attention went into making sure that our, um, our, our workforce was safe, um, and I know that was true here at JPL as well, and, and so it would be um, unwise to say to say anything otherwise, right? So it was definitely a contributor, but it was not the only reason. And so again, that's why um, we've addressed hybrid work and hiring and retention as part of our response. But we've also addressed, you know, the level how we're doing senior management engagement, how we're um, how the line management is supporting our missions, uh, and you know, a few other issues as well. So it, it was a part of the answer, but not the whole answer. Uh, thank you. And then um, to follow up, um, during the pandemic, um, there are a lot of people who, uh, for whom working from home was enabling people with disabilities, and then now there are people with long COVID um, who find the return to work difficult. And anecdotally, I've been observing that several of those types of people with these disabilities are having to leave JPL due to the changes now to returning to uh, more work. So I'm wondering how your um, addressing that with your retention um, issues that were identified in the report? Well, our, our policy uh, obviously is, is to make sure that we can accommodate people with disabilities fully. And so we have a process to do that. And in some cases, remote uh, and hybrid work can be a solution to accommodation issues. So, um, but we do that on a case-by-case -case basis, obviously, and, and um, through uh, very structured sort of set of activities. I am not. Um, I, I'm not aware of the anecdotal evidence that you mentioned there. In fact, I, I, I see quite the opposite, which is that many people are very happy to be back once they are back a few days a week. Very happy to be back on lab and and to be reconnecting with colleagues. But of course, understood that not everybody is going to be able to do that. And we also have. Um, you know, a fraction of our workforce, something between 15 and 20 percent, who are working fully remotely. And uh, our policy also calls for having those folks have a regular sort of at least quarterly in-person interaction with their team so that we keep those face-to-face -face connections um, as needed. Thank you, Lori. Uh, we're moving on to our next question, which is from Marina Corin with The Atlantic. Hi again, uh, this question is for Lori Glaze. Um, in your decision to focus on Psyche, how did NASA decide to delay 
Veritas instead of the other Venus mission that would have launched around the same time. Obviously, Veritas is the one that's managed by JPL, and maybe that's the only reason, but I don't want to assume, so I'm wondering why you chose Veritas for a delay. Thank you. Sure. So, you know, the, you know this was something that was really, really uh, difficult um, decision to make. Um, you know, no one wants to uh, to delay uh, any of the missions, and, and particularly a mission that uh, was actually um, doing well along their, their planned schedule. Um, but we did have uh, the uh, the IRB report, which had indicated that there were some challenges in, in staffing the missions out at JPL. Um, and so that's where the challenge was. Um, yes, there were some budget drivers as well, but as we're looking at where to where to uh, make an adjustment that can allow us to um, to respond to the to the IRB report. Um, it was clear that we wanted to uh, to try and alleviate some of the the, the stresses stressors and pressures out at JPL in a way that that uh, headquarters could have some control over. Um, and in doing that, we wanted to look within the planetary portfolio since that's uh, where where the Psyche mission resided, and we also wanted to look towards those missions that were earliest um, in their development, those that had not yet ramped up. So you heard Lori Leshen say earlier um, that the Veritas mission had not yet ramped up to their staffing level, and so that is a place where we could make some efforts. Um, yes, there is an impact, but it's um, you know an attempt to try and make that a minimal impact. Yeah, and I just want to add on to that, please, Laurie, which is, it, you know, just to make it clear, that was an SMD leadership decision. Um, they, they chose to delay um, Veritas based on the findings and recommendations of uh, the Psyche IRB report. Um, so it, it, it wasn't a planetary alone decision. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, looks like we are winding up. We do have one more question from Teresa Foley of Aerospace America. Hi, thank you. Um, I would like to ask about Mars sample return. I know that's not the main topic today, but um, I'm wondering, are there staffing and hiring issues uh, comparable where where does Mars sample return stand as far as uh, having enough talent? To, that's a really challenging mission. And just uh, to clarify, is that remote work policy three days a week on site? Is that a NASA wide policy or is that JPL? So I guess I have a two part question, but I'm quite interested in the Mars sample return, how things are going with that. All right, let me start with the Mars sample return, and then uh, Laurie come in, uh, either of the Laurie's actually come in behind me if, um, if, if you want to. So uh, no, Mars sample return is doing very well. Um, we have uh, the project is uh, making great progress on um, doing the formulation of the mission and uh, looking at all the ways to retire risk and uh, make that mission successful. We did um, kick off their independent review board last week. They kicked off at JPL. Um, and so they, of course, will be looking into all of the questions, making sure that um, you know, everything is, is on track with Mars sample return. But uh, they have a, a, you know extremely talented workforce working on that uh, difficult mission. Um, and uh, we have every confidence um, that they will move ahead um, and be successful. Uh, Laurie Lashen? Yeah, the um, the the hybrid work policy I mentioned is um, is only a JPL policy. Does anyone else know what the NASA wide pol policy is for um, days on on site versus working from home? So there is a, a we as civil servants uh, we have the we follow the OPM um, uh, rules, which are uh, two days um, two days on site every two weeks. Um, however, we have, a, you know, a, a people that come in a lot more frequently than that. Thank you. Thank you all so much. That is the last of our questions. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming today. If you have a, you know, a, a question that, that you know, we weren't able to get to and you want to send a note to me, Karen Fox, uh, please feel free and we'll see what we can do to get you additional information. Um, but thank you for joining us and uh, I think we will say goodbye. <laughs>